All right, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. My first time uh, at Mizzou, my first time in Missouri, actually. Um, and though the weather is very much reminiscent of the nine winters I spent in Wisconsin, I don't miss that part whatsoever. Uh, I'm glad you were brave enough to uh, come here today and listen to uh, what I have to say about CRISPR. So CRISPR, arguably, is one of the most compelling, most timely, most disruptive, and also, as a topic, very dramatic technologies uh, that we've had, perhaps, for a, a generation, arguably, maybe since PCR. I'm going to show you some metrics about this. Uh, and my goal today is to tell you my version of the story of CRISPR, which is not the only narrative that goes around, but I would argue it's a very historically factual, um, and then tell you that story with the background of entrepreneurship and all the disruptions that occur in the science and technology have led to disruptions that occur in industry and also for society. So as you all know, we already live in a CRISPR world. That ship has sailed. Right? You can't take that back. You can't change it back. And if you look at some of the numbers, uh, not quite uh, updated as of yet through the 2018 numbers, there's over 100,000 labs in the world that have been given access to CRISPR through AdGene. Give or take, maybe five to 10 scientists per lab is between a half a million and one million scientists across the globe that every day use that technology. It's unbelievable. They use uh, thousands of flavors of CRISPR from hundreds of labs. And as of last summer, we've hit over 10,000 scientific studies. And you look at the pace and the rate at which those studies are coming out. And if you look at the pace and, which, and the rate at which the, the research is occurring, you can tell this is surprisingly sustainable at least sustainable for the time being, right? And I've been in the CRISPR world long enough, probably too long, 15 years now, to see the CRISPR literature go from pretty much nothing. About 27 papers were published in total as of a decade ago. You could read the whole CRISPR literature in one afternoon, depending on your appetite for CRISPR literature at the time. And within about one PhD cycle, it went from 27 total to a paper a month to a paper a week, to a paper a day. And as of this year, it's more than 10 papers coming out every day on CRISPR. It's just unbelievable. And if you look at where those plasmids come from, it's very predictable, right? The US, a few advanced Western Europe countries, but some are surprising, like Denmark, Germany, and the UK, not so much. And then China, not so far behind. But more interestingly, if you look at where those plasmids are being shipped, again, as of last year, it's over 100 countries. Even parts of the world where maybe science and cutting edge science is not a priority. This is telling you already that we'll live in a CRISPR world. So the question is, how did we get here? And how did we get here so fast? And as a business school graduate, as a, as a scientist, and a former R&D director in the industry, it's amazing to see that very rarely do you see technology applications and products collide, right, and become a reality in such a short time span, less than a decade. In the case of CRISPR for genome editing, less than six years. This never happens. And what's amazing is that I'm gonna walk you through how CRISPR has gone from a scientific discovery, a scientific phenomenon, a biological function, the real role of CRISPR in biology to CRISPR tech, CRISPR technology, actually arguably CRISPR technologies with an S. There's many different things we can do with that. And I'm going to illustrate all the applications that this one million scientists have been able to use and harness that technology for. And then also from a business standpoint, walk you through the products some of which have already launched, some of which you may have already consumed. Who thinks here they've consumed a CRISPR-enhanced product? All right, let's see how you answer the question in 15 minutes. And then last but not least, I'm gonna walk you through the bottlenecking 
of CRISPR technology. When science is easy or straightforward, when technology is leverageable, when the applications are a plenty and the business potential is unprecedented, science is the easy part. And I would argue that already as of today, the only limiting factor that we have for the advancement of CRISPR technology is not the technology in and of itself, but much rather the acceptance of that technology by the grand public. And one of my objectives today is to illustrate how you all in the audience are going to be instrumental in the acceptance of that technology in society. So we'll go through that and how academics are uniquely positioned to nudge and enable the industry, nudge and enable the government. I've heard about Jeff City way too many times today. That's a good sign. And then last but not least, society. And this is what I used to call the, the innovator's dilemma as a, as a scientist and academic, but more and more so as a true entrepreneur's dilemma. How do we go from this to this in less than 10 years? And how can we, as academics, go all the way to influencing industry, government, and society? So let's start with the science. It starts with the science. This is an academic institution about scientific knowledge. I've talked about science all day long. This is not a science seminar per se, but I cannot not talk about CRISPR in a scientific context. So first of all, there's two species of CRISPR, right? There's the real CRISPR clustered, regularly, interspaced, short, palindromic repeats, which is biologically the adaptive immune system in bacteria. That's where my journey in CRISPR started. That's what I think is the coolest. But sadly enough, nobody really cares. A couple hundred scientists in the world, a couple dozen labs, nice papers, claims to fame, but really, you didn't come here to hear about this. You came here to hear about this. CRISPR is not an adaptive immune system, right? I once gave a talk and a pitch to an investor and started with, this is CRISPR. The guy was like, nah, nobody cares. CRISPR is a tool. I want to hear about that, not about that crap. That's the reality of the world that we live in. This was not a scientific seminar. This was a business pitch. I wanted him to give me money. He didn't want me to tell him about this crap. He wanted me to tell him about how we're going to use that to make money. So I used to think those two worlds barely touched, eventually uh, maybe French kiss to some extent, and now are fully embedded one into the other. But being a student, this is where I went to school so many times for so long, I realized that the real CRISPR world is small, tiny. It's cool, but again, a couple dozen scientists who really care about the science. Nobody else cares about this. And really, my world, the CRISPR world, has been taken over by the genome editing world. <laughs> so you've all heard about CRISPR. Who's worked on CRISPR thus far here? Show of hands, and full of people. If I ask that question five years from now, most high school students will have done some exercises in high school working on CRISPR, right? Like freshmen, even at Mizzou, will learn to use CRISPR like in their first lab, Biology 101. So for all of you experts in the room, this is actually what CRISPR looks like. Clustered, regularly, interspaced, short palindromic repeats. This is my first CRISPR. And this is what you should see. And I didn't do the Mizu black and gold, but you know, if you're not read a verse, this is what CRISPR is. This is an actual CRISPR locus. Clustered, because they all co-occur together, one peculiar locus in the genome of about 46% of archaea and 91%. 46% uh, of you bacteria, 96%, 91% of, uh, of archaea. Regularly interspaced here with exquisite periodicity. You see the spacing here. Short, because they are 31 to 36 nucleotides long, depending on the class, the type, and the subtype. P for palindromic, you can see the, the expert eye of geneticists in the audience. The G, T, 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 T here is the reverse complement of the A, C, and the three prime end. And R for repeat. Repeat, space and 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 repeat. It can grow up to 587 units long for the CRISPR record holder today. This is probably the first time you guys see an actual CRISPR. Sadly enough, I'm going to predict this is the last time you see an actual CRISPR, unless you come to another of my seminars. Uh, but at least you've seen a CRISPR one time in your life. You can explain what it is 
and what it looks like, though nobody really cares. I'm going to tell you, though, that there's no actual CRISPR in the CRISPR tools that you guys buy. Because all you get is the guide RNA. But guide RNA is no one year as sexy as CRISPR. We're going to stick with CRISPR. So now that we know what it is, uh, what does it actually do? So it's the adaptive immune system of bacteria. One of the reasons you're all here today is because we have adaptive immunity as vertebrates. It's based on the interaction, the stereophysical recognition of antibodies and antigenes. Conceptually, CRISPR is the same thing in bacteria, but rather than be protein-protein driven, it's nucleic acid, nucleic acid driven. Okay, so it's DNA encoded, RNA mediated, nucleic acid targeting. And what CRISPR does is capture over time, so think like a, a mugshot for your iPhone, capture over time a piece of DNA from an invasive virus and keep it in this CRISPR locus as a new spacer. So what I just showed you right here, right, this would be a piece of DNA captured from a virus at a point in time. And if we had CRISPRs as human, I'd be able to look at your locus and make a list over time of how many bad decisions you've made in your life. And in what order and how this compares and contrasts to the immune potential of your special friends. So it's a good thing we don't have that. All right. And really, the only thing that's important for you guys to know about CRISPR from a biological standpoint is there's a lot of different systems. They have a lot of different genes involved. They're idiosyncratic in their molecular mechanism of action. They're all DNA encoded. They're all RNA mediated. They're all nucleic acid targeting. But the motifs, the sequences, the guides, the mechanism of action, the recognition patterns, and the cleavage patterns vary widely. I'm not going to give you a talk on CRISPR basics. All you need to know is different types of CRISPR. Some target DNA, some target RNA. Some shred, some have exonucleolytic activity, some have endonucleolytic activity. And the bottom line is some are very precise and have the ability to generate blunt DNA cleavage or sticky end molecular cuts. The history of CRISPR is pretty long. So if you guys want to go through the history of CRISPR, go back to the literature back from 1987, a long, long time ago. And CRISPR was a bastard for about 15 years. It was a nameless bastard. It didn't get baptized until 15 years later. It didn't get characterized experimentally until 20 years later. But the world changed right here. We went from the dark ages of CRISPR, the middle ages of CRISPR, into the modern period. But really, the world of CRISPR changed right here and right then when CRISPR was repurposed for genome editing. When CRISPR graduated from an interesting scientific phenomenon to a technology. That's what changed the world of CRISPR. This is the world before CRISPR. This is after CRISPR. This is probably when you guys started to hear about CRISPR, learn about CRISPR, care about CRISPR, not the science behind it, but CRISPR, the genome editing tool. So what is this genome editing magical technology? So you've all used probably a razor at some point in your life. You shave a part of your body you don't need to hear about tonight. Um, and the bottom line is, I'm going to uh, behoove you to think of CRISPR as a molecular scalpel. It is a molecular razor which has the ability to selectively, precisely, and programmably cut DNA, in this particular case, type 2 with a signature Cas9. And Jennifer showed that you can reprogram and repackage the machinery into a very portable two-component system that mimics the natural complex that exists in nature to generate double-stranded DNA breaks. She showed that CRISPR is a molecular scalpel that allows you to cut DNA much like you guys would cut yourself. So what happens when you cut yourself? You bleed. Maybe you scream for a minute. You squeak. And then eventually, you're going to clot and repair your cut. So in the DNA world, this is how genome editing occurs, right? You cut yourself, you cut your skin, you cut your DNA, and you recruit repair mechanisms. If you're in the middle of the winter and you're stuck outside and you cut yourself, 
or you're hunting somewhere, or you're playing hockey, or football, or some kind of like rough sport, what do you do? You're gonna patch it back together, sew it back together, duct tape it back together, maybe go to the vet and get a stitch or something. This is gonna leave a scar. In the genetic world, this is the equivalent of non-homologous end joining. You're gonna take your two pieces of DNA that have been cut and sliced apart and patch that back together in a quick and dirty manner. And you have a scar precisely at the site of cleavage. Quick and dirty NHEJ. Now, if you're not a hockey player or you don't want a scar, let's say you're vain, maybe some of you are vain, right? You don't want to go to the vet or tape yourself up. Where do you go? You're going to go to the medical school or to the hospital and have a surgeon patch you back together. The DNA equivalent of this, this is what Fong showed exactly six years ago, almost to the day, is you can actually recruit the surgical DNA repair machinery called homology directed repair. Provision the cell with a repair template that you design to selectively introduce a mutation, a SNP, generate an insertion, or generate a deletion. You can provision the DNA repair machinery with a template to generate an outcome precisely engineered by the user and programmable using the accuracy and programmability of the CRISPR-Cas system. As of January 2013, we have the ability to precisely, selectively, and efficiently change the writing of the DNA, edit the sequence of the DNA precisely thanks to CRISPR. That stuff is so last year, it's not even funny. Six years later, CRISPR went from an embryonic technology to a six-year-old. And the six-year-old is extremely sophisticated. That toolbox, the CRISPR toolbox, the molecular toolbox, the genome editing toolbox, has graduated to enable people to delete, insert, or knock out genes at will. You can also deactivate the enzymatic ability of Cas9, the dual Nikkeis, HNH and RFC, Nikkei's domains, to turn Cas9 into a DNA binding protein. It has such affinity for DNA that you can prevent the progression of an RNA polymerase. If you're a biochemist in the audience, you're very impressed. We now have the ability to turn the super machinery into a transcriptional control machine. You activate, if you tether it to an activator, turn on transcription, or to repress, if you tether it to a repressor, to turn down transcription, or even turn it off. You can change the punctuation. You can make it very loud, make it very quiet. We have the ability to tether DCAS9 and fuse it to affected domains of interest, like a deaminase to do precise base editing. Right? You can tether it to acetyltransferase and methylase to alter the epigenetic state of a sequence of interest, or you can tether it to fluorophores and multiplex that to CRISPR rainbow in a sixplex to do imaging. This means we have the ability today, six years in, to edit any genome we want, any way we want, for about 100 bucks of material. It's unbelievable. This is what has fueled the CRISPR crate. I'm going to show you one example. This is the example I use for 10-year-old, right? Butterfly. People love butterflies. Nobody hates butterflies. I hate butterflies. No. What's peculiar about butterflies is their wing pattern. The butterfly wing pattern is the equivalent of the human iris. It's unique in the world. No two butterflies have the same color pattern, much like no two humans have the same iris. CRISPR is so powerful that you can take this butterfly, pick out some cells, use CRISPR, reprogram CRISPR to target a gene called yellow. I'm going to let you guys guess the yellow gene encodes for the color yellow. And you can knock out the yellow gene and grow another butterfly. This is why this one is smaller, which has the exact same dang wing pattern as the parent. You can make a clone of a butterfly as of 2014 to recolor a butterfly. You can change the color to make it more or less brown, more or less orange. You get the point. And I use this one example to show and illustrate 
that if we can do that to butterflies as of 2014, there's arguably no scientific or technical limitation to what you can do with CRISPR. You can do anything you want, any way you want, in any species you want, which is both a gift and a curse, depending on how imaginative or how crazy you may be. And this is the CRISPR conundrum. In the last six years, all those scientists across the world have been able to implement CRISPR-based technologies in hundreds of species. I'm yet to hear one species in which CRISPR doesn't work, in which has been tested by competent people. So at the base of the pyramid here, you have the academics working on model organisms, viruses, bacteria, yeast, and on and on, non-humanoid non chain. Great. Fantastic. 10,000 studies strong. CRISPR works. You can do anything you want, any way you want, in any species you want, almost just like that. And then the real people, like people in Mizzou, work on the real stuff. We heard about CRISPR pigs. Awesome. The stuff you want to eat, crops, vegetables. Not, not CRISPR pig, CRISPR bacon. Not, not crisp, CRISPR. Right? Same with like chicken. Not crisp chicken, CRISPR chicken. It works with like shrimp and whatnot, you get the point. And of course, at the very top of the value chain, medicine. There's a reason you're building a medical institute. This is where the money is. Billions of dollars, hopefully, of licensing revenues down the line after an investment in Jefferson City. So people have shown you can use all those tools to do all those things in all those organisms. How did we get here? So CRISPR just turned six years old. This is six year old, right? This is the most charming, smartest, most powerful, scariest six year old you've seen in your life. Why is that? Well, it's programmable, specific, transferable, efficient, precise, affordable, quick, multiplexable, and scalable. It's crazy. You can do all that stuff. You can order a construct from Magene today before 3 p.m. Eastern, and weather permitting, get in your lab tomorrow. It's crazy. But it's only six years old. You guys seen a six-year-old, right? They're not always reliable. They throw a tantrum here and there. Right? They don't always do what they're told. So think of any technology six years in. The first computer six years in. The first plane six years in. The first iPhone six years in. Right? The first laptop six years in. The first car six years in. The first snowplow six years in, right? You would understand that with only six years of technological development, your expectations have to be somewhat moderate, somewhat reasonable. Yet I'm amazed to hear everyday people like, man, this CRISPR stuff got to get better, 10 times better, 100 times better. Dude, we're five years in. Relax. Great. We're going to get there. So there's a few things we still need to do. Optimize guide design, engineer cast rationally, a random by evolution. Work on orthogonality to concurrently do multiple flavors of CRISPR at the same time to edit and alter the epigenome and upregulate some genes, downregulate some genes. We need about six to seven orthogonal systems to do that. And we need some you know, PAM diversity to have very precise targeting. We're getting there. Give us like six to 12 more months. We'll get there. We're almost there. Don't worry about that so much. What CRISPR has done, though, for genome editing, it has changed the bottleneck from can we cut precisely right here to can we actually control, predict the repair outcome 100% of the time and 100% of the cell? The answer is we're not there yet. We certainly do not even understand what all the DNA repair pathways in play are. How about MMEJ or AEJ? What's the propensity? Cell cyclicality, various organisms. So now we have to do probably 10 years of DNA repair research to predictably control the outcome of editing in all organisms of interest. And as always, for those of you who work on translational medicine, um, it's hard to deliver stuff to humans. You want to do HIV, we're actually going to have to edit 100% of the time, 100% of the cells in a whole human patient. I can take a patient, dunk them in a pool of CRISPR, come back tomorrow and say, how'd you do? You can do that with a plant. 
grow a thousand plants, ten thousand plants in a big greenhouse, and pick the one. You can't quite do that with pigs. We can do that with chickens, right? So we still have to work on delivery. And this is why in the first generation of crystal-based technologies and products, we're going to work, or people are going to work, and selectively look for the proverbial no-hanging fruit. Cases in which, like DMD, we don't have to edit 100% of the muscle cells. Double digits, good enough. 18 months, fantastic. Right? We have to have a delivery means. So blood disease, ex vivo therapies, eye disease, you can stab people in the eye and deliver it to the eye, much like you do the muscle. Probably it's as brutal as it sounds. Right? Or liver, we can deliver to the liver. There's a reason it's called like that. But brain, no. Uh -uh. I'm going to stab you in the brain, come back tomorrow and see, hey, how are your neurons are doing? So we'll, we'll get there in due time. We're not there yet. So that technology now has already been used by hundreds of labs and implemented to drive a number of applications in what I'm going to call my, my four buckets. From left to right, increasing the value chain. Any business school people in the audience? No, they don't know about CRISPR yet. All right, so research use, the tools, the guys, the enzyme, the software, the plasmids, the delivery, the kills, the primers, the cell lines, even the organisms, right? Now you can just order your CRISPR mouse. A couple hundred bucks. It's almost trivialized. It's unfair. It's crazy. It's unreasonable. What do you mean it's going to take you six weeks? What? Like, like you got a PhD just a couple of years ago to do a knockout mouse. Now it's like it's going to cost you a couple hundred bucks before complaint. I want it like yesterday. Can you do it faster and cheaper? Please. Same with industrial biotech. Bacteria, yeast, algae used across the food, biomanufacturing, household care, enzyme, bioenergy, biofuel. This stuff is so last year. If you're in the bio industry world, you have been using CRISPR for years. All your industrial workhorses are done. We've already graduated to ag, plants, animals, microbes. Trees, flowers, ornamentals, bushes. I mean, if we can change the color of a wing pattern of a butterfly, we can recolor flowers. We can recolor wood, different redness in different trees, different textures in different poplar species. Unbelievable. More or less grainy. And we match your color of interest. And last but not least, aquaculture lagging a little bit behind. And of course, therapies, medicine. This is again not non-exhaustive list: gene therapies, antivirals, anti-ID microbiomes, antimicrobials, cell CAR T immunotherapies, growing tissues in humanized organisms, protein transplantations, gene drives, diagnostics, pet care, and on and on and on. If you just look at IB, right? Enzymes, proteins, biofuels, biomass, vitamins, cheese and yogurt. I'll get back to that. Probiotics, antibiotics, insulin. So last year. So what's in the cards for 2019? Well, we already know that the three leading CRISPR technologies, Intelia, CRISPR-TX, and Editas, have plans to get into the clinic in the next 12 months with serious people like Regeneron and Novartis, Vertex, Juno, respectively. We know they're going to do better thalassemia, sickle cell disease, Libra congenital amaurosis, and others. This is publicly available information from the quarterly updates. And every quarter on the clock, they have to update all those investors. It's very transparent. Listen to a call, an investor call from one of those three companies sometime in the next six months. It's fascinating to hear the speed and rate at which those technologies are being implemented in the clinic. Probably, I would guess, Three gene therapy clinical trials this year, two in the US, one in Europe. It's happening. By the end of the year, we'll know if and how well this works. You look at the future of CRISPR in eukaryotes, you can look at what's happening today in prokaryotes. That's another lesson we've learned from CRISPR, right? Once it works in prokaryotes, people are doing it in eukaryotes. So just in my lab with a couple, you know, dozen people, we can do genotyping, antivirals, vaccination genome editing, traditional control, genome remodeling, and targeted killing. Think of being able to use CRISPR to kill cancer cells. 
a desirable cell, disease cell, genotypically abnormal cell. So we can use this vaccination card. I'm not going to go into details here for the sake of time. But you can use the vaccination card that the cell captures over time, over all the bad decisions it makes or special friends it hangs out with. And you can use this barcode as a tag to tell where strains are, where they come from, where they've been, and how they relate to one another. This was the first CRISPR patent applied for 15 years ago. It has been used in the industry for products, pathogens, cultures, large organisms now being used for microbiomes and metagenomics to understand infectious disease, to understand manufacturing, to understand Department of Defense, bioweapons, to understand your next Chipotle outbreak. So last year, salmonella, E. coli, which O type do you have? Have we seen it before? Or do you have the same C. diff isolate in different patients in the same hospital suite or not? So last year, check it out. Now, CRISPR has been commercialized by DuPont. This strain, DuPont Global Culture Collection 7710, makes the best yogurt in the world. Just take my word for it. And this guy is hammered by phages all the time. Phages that are ubiquitous in milk, in the milk supply chain, where you have cow's milk from Argentina, or you have you know, cattle milk from China, or buffalo mozzarella in Italy. All over. Phages are an inconvenience. Uh, but this is the name of the game. So you can take this strain, expose it to that virus, and naturally select a variant that vaccinates itself by acquiring a new spacer when it becomes resistant. Take that guy, expose it to the second phage, and select a natural variant that picks up a new piece of DNA from the phage, do it a third time and a fourth time, and within about a week's worth of isolation and screening, you can get a fourth generation vaccinated bacterium which is resistant to all phages relevant for the industry. You can do that two or three times in parallel, blend those strains, and make yogurt forever. Those products have been commercialized by DuPont globally since 2011. And DuPont is the number one manufacturer of cultures for dairy in the world. So this means that if you've had one bite of cheese, one bite of yogurt, one cheeseburger, one pizza, one nacho, whether you're in Jefferson City, or St. Louis, or Shanghai, or Beijing, or Buenos Aires, or Paris, at any given point in time since 2011, there's a 100% chance you've consumed a product that was CRISPR in hand. I'll let you think about that. This technology has also been used by DuPont and others to use this vaccination record as a genetic tag of bacterial strains and industrial workhorses. So imagine a phage that comes in and a host that comes in and sees a phage that's yellow, blue, pink, red, green. If I see my yellow, blue, pink, red, green tag in a product that you didn't buy from me, you're in trouble. Good luck trying to explain to a lawyer in a court of law how you randomly came across my unique tag. DuPont has been doing this to tie their cultures for 10 years. I'll let you think about that. You can also use CRISPR to target self in bacteria and behoove bacteria responsible for infectious disease to kill themselves. And to do that, we don't use the little surgical scalpel. We use the chainsaw. We use the exonuclease version the CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR-Cas3, they will chew up 10 to 100 kb of DNA within seconds. And bacteria suck at DNA repair. Take my word for it. So we now have the ability to reprogram specifically and strategically CRISPR-Cas systems in bacteria responsible for infectious disease or killing. You can take two strains that are 99.9% .9 identical and kill one or the other or both. And you can modulate this to E. coli or salmonella and kill E. coli, or kill salmonella, or kill both. We now have the ability to engineer and design programmable antibiotics that leave the microbiome alone and just take out bacteria responsible for infectious disease. 
This means that those CRISPR technologies can be used across the food supply chain to edit crops, edit livestock, edit food cultures, edit probiotics, and alter all those organisms across the food supply chain. You can target bacteria specifically and say, I'm going to kill E. coli at the farm level. I'm going to reduce lactic acid bacteria that spoil, right? Let's say a vat. I can enhance texture production in yogurt starter cultures to make them more ropey. Is it you like the ropey yogurt, the flat yogurt? Or we can change the cell surface composition of probiotics to alter the dialogue with the host immune system. You can alter any organism of interest any way you want for any functional uh, item for which a genotype has been characterized. So science to tech to app to products in less than 10 years. For all those areas, tools, IV, ag, and therapeutics. And you can see this is an ag-rich institution. You can see how the whole ag landscape has changed, is changing, or will be dramatically disrupted in short order. Whether you're talking about livestock, we heard about pigs, or yogurt, or plants, whether you want to increase yield, or increase water efficiency, or change disease, or do the non-browning mushroom. So last year, row crops, non-row crops, fruits, vegetables, tobacco, cotton, trees, biofuel, grasses. I heard about grasses earlier today. Cellulosic ethanol, same thing. Fibers in wood, it's happening. This means that the limiting factor is not the science. The science is not easy. I don't want to trivialize that. It's straightforward. It's feasible. If you put enough resources and enough smart people in a problem and give them CRISPR, they'll figure it out. So the challenge is society. The challenge is the regulators. The challenge is the public. Because scientifically, we're done. Anyway, people argue over who invented CRISPR and who's going to get the Nobel. That's it. It's great. It's sad, but it's great. Every week, CRISPR makes the cover of one of those magazines. Fantastic. We should celebrate more. And CRISPR has spilled over outside of the scientific realm into the real media. Every week, there's an NPR show on CRISPR. Time 100 famous people, New York Times, Forbes, cover of Time Magazine, cover of The Economist. And since J.K. He did human CRISPR, the whole world knows about it, the whole world heard about it, the whole world condemns it. CRISPR black eye for society, mostly for science, right? If some idiot in China can allegedly edit humans, science is not the limiting factor. We now know that. To give you an idea, we even now have, I'm the editor-in-chief of the CRISPR journal, a whole journal just dedicated to CRISPR. Somebody told me 10 years ago this would happen, or I thought they were crazy. If you look at the intersection of science and business. Those are all the people who just are sponsoring the next CRISPR meeting. As a kept secret, I'm very thankful to Bayer for inviting me tonight and paying for this event. There are some conferences that push back sponsors because they have too many sponsors. They don't know where to spend the money. So the real revolution is not scientific. The real revolution is not the media. The real revolution is happening in the boardroom. All those companies, food, biotech, ag, medicine, translational medicine, large, big, Fortune 50, Fortune 10, not-for-profit, big and small, new VC, ancient company. They're all in. Look at Bayer, Vertex, Novartis, Johnson Johnson, Allergan, Celgene, GSK, Amgen, Baxter, AstraZeneca, and on and on and on. They've all placed a CRISPR bet. We live in the CRISPR world on the business side, too. This is a snapshot of CRISPR startups that have come out in the last couple of years. First generation, Caribou, Intelia, CRISPR-TX, ER Genomics, and Editas. Edit 
TRSP, NTLA, NASDAQ. All those companies went from an idea to the ringing bell at the NASDAQ in less than 24 months. That's crazy. Never happens. At one point, their street value was $5.7 billion. 3.2 as of uh, today. Crazy. Three companies. Last 15 months, Beam TX, Mammoth, Casibia, and eGenesis, next generation of therapeutic companies. Locust Bio, Next Biotics, Illigo, Sniper, next generation of antimicrobial. Biofedit, Arbor, Kazam, next generation of CRISPR tools. KOS Plants and Inari, next generation of CRISPR Act. Those are just CRISPR based startup companies. Why? Because the issues are ethical. PR, and regulatory. The science is the easy part. How are we going to regulate this stuff? The food, the ag, the therapeutics. How are we going to approach the public with this? And what does the Pope think about CRISPR? The Pope himself convened and invited a group of scientists to discuss our duty to care. We have a moral duty to use CRISPR to cure disease. The Pope says that. What regulatory agency is going to say, nah? CRISPR is bad. The Pope says you should use CRISPR. Right? I was invited at Oxford to debate the benefits of CRISPR in their debate society. As mentioned, South by Southwest officially announced that you're off the hook. Right? The CRISPR documentary is going to come out two years in the making. And you can see ag is featured heavily. It's going to make it look nice and professional. It's going to make it look green. This could be any farm in any state. Can't tell whether it's Mizu or NC. Can't tell how flat it is. Unless you've been there, you know what it is. is. Right? So I had an epiphany. Human Nature is the name of the movie. Humannaturefilm.com is the uh, address if you want to check it out. The trailer will come out early next week. The epiphany was there's about 7 to 8 million scientists in the world. That's team science. That's us. Seven millions, L large number, right? So there's like seven to eight million of us, and there's like eight billion of them. That means that every single one of us has to reach out to a thousand people and spread the gospel of CRISPR, the CRISPR whisperer. And guess what? We suck at that job. I mean, y'all suck at that job as much as I do, right? I mean, most of us cannot even convince our own siblings and parents and friends and family that the scientific enterprise is there for their benefit. Hashtag last Christmas, hashtag last Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? We suck at this. We spend most of our time arguing with other scientists about the things we disagree about with science. Hashtag seminar, <laughs> hashtag a scientific conference, right? And we're losing the battle. So this kind of movie, I hope, or maybe I dream, foolishly so, uh, they will help us change the opinion of more than 1,000 people a pop. We'll see. Go check it out. Tell me what you think. Adam Bolt was the guy who did the inside job, was the director for this uh, movie. So I hope he did a good job. We'll see. So nowadays, there's a lot of efforts across select academic circles to teach academics how to talk to non-scientists about science. This is a crazy exercise, but we have to try. Okay. So some of the learnings are, well, you know, the public sucks about science. We knew that. Right? You've got to put it in the right realm, and they want credential and liked experts. And bottom line is leading scientists, scientists, and academics have to do their job. We cannot let our former friends at Monsanto do the job. Bayer will do a much better job. Maybe. Okay, And you have to tell them what they want to hear, not what they don't want to hear about. You have to know what they value. You have to know what values we have in common. So yeah, we, we're working on CRISPR for food safety. We're working on CRISPR for sustainability. We're working on CRISPR for the environment. We're working on CRISPR for animal well-being. We want to have transparent science, science-based decisions. Economic growth. We want you to trust the science enterprise 
and we're going to respect your opinions, even if we disagree. If you get off those things and you start to preach the gospel of science, keep your mouth shut. This stuff is for the classroom, not the radio. The scientific argument is not going to win the public. You have to have a values-based, shared interest. Not the how you do it, the why you're doing it. Just stick to that. That's what I've learned last week. And it's critical for you today, that's one of the reasons I'm here, because I'm going to predict that regardless of the progress we have pending in the clinic, ag is going to win the CRISPR race. Why? Because ethical issues are lower, IP path is accessible, we can deliver, we can screen, we can recapitulate natural genotypes. The USDA and Sony Purdue Secretary of Ag is supportive. We can do DNA free. We can do non DNA alteration. We can screen the one in a thousand plants. And we can do all those things faster and cheaper and better. And that's why institutions like Mizzou will make a difference. And that's why you all in the room have to spread the word. All right. So I think there's hope that check, 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 and we're working on this. And you all academics will have to work with our industrial partners, Jefferson City, NDC, and society to convince them. So I'm here also to talk about entrepreneurship. So I've gone to school a number of times, Paris, Compiègne, NC State a couple of times, back when Chris was a junior faculty member, and went to business school. Arguably the best, most valuable degree I've got. Because the, the before and after difference with the MBA is much bigger than any of those degrees. And I've worked with a number of companies. So 10 years at DuPont, I was the only director, nine years, as a matter of fact. I was the faculty in State for six years. I was chairman of the board for Caribou for four years, co-founder and advisor to Intelia for the last five years, co-founder and investor in Locus Biosciences, advisor and SCB member for Anari, editor-in-chief of the CRISPR Journal, and we'll see if the name sticks or not, Arborist, a new tree company based on genome editing. And I'm working on three new startup companies I can't talk about. My learnings from those places and some of those places, anonymized here in a random order, is that if you want to be an entrepreneur, and build companies that will one day ring the bell of the NASDAQ, you need to do this stuff. You need good leadership. This is good. This is OK. This is TBD. Good leadership, good team, good tech, maybe good values, good IP, tech transfer offices, hashtag we need you, fundraising, a good footprint. You need facilities to host them. You need to execute. Strategic plannings are worth a lot. You need to find good partners, develop products, do PR, and have a sustainable business model. Very few companies do that well. One has done very well. We'll see if he's sustainable. And others have a lot of work to do. That's why in an academic, this stuff is hard. If that were my full-time job, I wouldn't be as happy or rested as I am right now. But you may have the stomach for it. Some of the learnings, too, are that diversity matters. Hashtag diversity. Right? Part of the reason why the CRISPR Journal is doing well is people come from across the globe, cultural, ethnic, genetic, phenotypic diversity is important for success. We know that, but we don't always do it. Very important, very critical. CRISPR is maybe the best example that women are fueling the next technological revolution. I recently gave a talk at the Rosalind Franklin Institute. One of the reasons why CRISPR has gone so far and so fast is because of all the women who have propelled and advanced the science, the technology, the commercialization of those applications in the real world. Jennifer, obviously, that people like a first time CEO, fresh out of the lab. One of the fiercest CRISPR companies out there. Intelli Therapeutics, board of directors members, founders, board of directors, ex-CEO of Editas, board of directors, 
CTO, CRO, and three founders are women for Casibia. Senior VPs, CEO, CSO, and VOD for Eugenesis, CEO, CSO, and two senior VPs for Inariat. Many of those companies and some of those that are the best companies involve women more and more. Keep that in mind. Another ingredient is faculty. That's why I'm here today. Right, back in the days, you got to teach and do research, publish and get funding. This stuff is so last decade. Come on. You all know, you can't just do that. You can't just teach, get a few grants, publish a couple of papers. It's not going to cut it. Right? When you're part of the future of Mizu, you got to step up and be an ambassador, be an entrepreneur, develop talent, coach your students and your alumni, write not just grants, and administer and advocate and nudge the rest of the world. You have to be a leader, not just a thinker, not just a philosopher. You have to embrace those challenges. And I've done that, and it's hard. Right? You have to invent stuff and give that to Tech Transfer Office so they can commercialize it, license it for you. You have to place your assets not just in academia, but in the real companies that make the real world turn around. You need to give a lot of talks. I think I've given 367 talks on CRISPR since I've been in faculty six years ago. Maybe one day you get to ring the bell of the NASDAQ. Maybe. It's tough, but it's fun. You go to school a lot. You can see I look the most tired here. Right? You need to coach your talent. This guy right here is CTO at a CRISPR company. This guy right here is a director at a startup company. And maybe in the end you get some credit for what you do, but Nobody really cares. So if you aspire to be an entrepreneur as a faculty member, right, you want to do this, right? you need to have any three connections. Have you gotten funding from companies? Are you doing consulting? Are you collaborating? Are you collaborative? Do you work with other people? Do you play nice? Have you filed for patents and have those patents been licensed? Are you visible? Do you care about coming out of your shell? Have you placed people in the real world? And would you be able to give up a seminar to pitch to an investor? It can be traumatic, but it's a lot of fun. Go to the business school, give a talk, see how that goes. Would you put your own money in? And how much? I mean, if you write a $1,000 check, you can be laughed at. Better off saying nothing. I've put in a lot of money. I've gotten zero money so far from all my ventures. My wife is none too pleased. <laughs> Right? But it's play money. Right? Would you recruit people? Would you help recruit people? I told Ori today, right? If you want to have a startup company today, dream with your startup company, and let's assume you have all this stuff ready to go. You have all that. How long would it take you to bring together three CEO candidates that are legit? Because if you live in SFO or Boston, you can't do that within three days, you're out of the market. If you live in RTP, it's going to take you two or three weeks to find three good potential CEO leads. If you're in Colombia, how long would it take to line up three people to come here and interview for the job? Point of that. I don't have the answer to that. I hope you have the answer to that. That's what you need. So the bottom line here is check, 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 check. You guys are networked, Jefferson City. You guys are bringing some industry. And we're going to need all those people, SOAR, AAAS, FFAR, CFI, NAS, Food Forum, and more to help nudge those people. Right? And this is why I'm in North Carolina. We have a lot of organizations that help us do that. We have the CEO pool. We have the investors. You hear tomorrow about the wealth of the Michigan network. They can raise billion, literally. Raising 20 mil is like nothing for Kelly. It's that good. Okay, you need money to make money and spend it. So I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Dr. Dauber, one of your vice chancellors and new dean of Gaffner. He's a strategic guy, right? So I went to his uh, latest version, which is not the latest version overall, because this will be rolled out in due time. 
but some of his strategic priorities. And it's funny because much of that resonates with what I do every day. Much of that should already resonate with what you do or maybe should do every day. Ensure student success, advance research and innovation, promote leadership, not just for you, but all those people. Empower Missourians. I suck at that job, but that's your job. Cultivate a diverse and inclusive community. I think there's some work that can be done there for sure. We all know that. And then acknowledging global citizenship. So I'm going to thank you for your attention. I'm going to uh, disclose all my funding here. Much internal support from NC State, my old friends at DuPont, collaborating with Duke and Charlie Gersbach and Jennifer here, uh, BSF, Pioneer, Corteva, AgriSciences. And then we'll disclose all my conflict of interest here. I'm a former director and shareholder of DuPont. I'm a former chairman of the board and investor in Caribou. I'm a, not an investor, they've asked for my money, they have plenty of it. But I'm a co-founder and SAB member for Intelia. I'm an investor and founder for Locus Bio. I'm the editor-in-chief of the CRISPR Journal, and I'm an advisor and shareholder of NREI. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions as time and weather permit. Thank you. Please. We hear a lot. Maybe uh, I'll let you get the mic. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brerengu. Yes, uh, please, we have some time for questions. And if you would please uh, put your questions in the mic. That way we can put it out over the live stream. Thank you. OK. So we hear a lot about this patent fight. Yeah. How is that affecting startup companies that are using the technology? Are they paying both places? Uh, what is the strategy to deal with that? So it's an inconvenience. It's a well-publicized inconvenience. It's being sorted out. It will be sorted out. They'll either settle in court or out of court. Depending on where you are geographically, different people have different strongholds. So early on, the Broad Institute, MIT, Harvard, had most of the uh, IP issued in the US. But now, uh, Caribou and UC Berkeley is getting IP issued. So the challenge is not the patents. The challenge is the FTO. So ask your lawyer about that. And in the rest of the world, notably in Europe, it's the opposite. Actually, the Broad Institute has been rebooted, and the uh, UC, uh, University of California, Berkeley, slash Vienna IP, has been issued and granted. So as far as companies are concerned, it's an inconvenience. It's an investment. It's lawyer fees. It's millions of dollars being wasted in, in courts uh, and battles and interference proceedings and the like. But in the end, it actually is reflecting how good the technology is. So the only inconvenience is how much of your balance sheet and how much of your fundraising efforts are going to have to go to securing FTO and to building your own IP portfolio. It's an inconvenience, but it hasn't stopped innovation. It hasn't slowed down the creation of companies. It hasn't prevented even the 10 biggest pharma companies from placing bets. The question is, how smart do you think you are at predicting the future? And uh, how good are your lawyers? But to me, it's an inconvenience, but it hasn't changed the game. Great for journalists, though, to talk about drama, but it's been over-dramatized, in my humble opinion. And as an investor, I've put money in. Somebody's going to win. And they'll settle out. It's not. Yeah, I have a question that's so yesterday. Uh, so, um, oh, do you think there's a limit to the size of a piece of DNA that can be knocked in with CRISPR? So the size of the DNA that can be knocked in is not CRISPR dependent. First of all, it's right. genome repair dependent. So depending on what you want to do, um, you could think of doing multiple cuts. So wh whether it's sequentially or in one shot, I'm not sure they were just saying. But I've seen up to 100 kV come in. And where, where did you see that? I've seen, well, it's not published yet. I've seen up to 105 KB come out in bacteria. One shot, one single shot, 6% of the genome being altered. It depends what you're targeting. Is it essential or not? Is it critical or not? Is it part of an important pathway or not? Um, and people are doing rounds at 10 KB a piece. You can iteratively do multiple rounds of 10 kb in plants and eukaryotes. Yeah, there's some people multiplexing to the 
thousands. So some of those companies, again, much of it is not published, may, may not be published anytime soon. Multiplexing, can we do a thousand edits in a quarter in an organism? Not one, not 10, not 100, but we're at the scale of thousands, including in plants. So we'll see. Um, I think actually industry is probably about 12 to 18 months ahead in model organisms of what's been published in literature. So mid-February, I think third week of February, I'm hosting the Keystone Gene Rating Symposium in, uh, in um, Victoria, west of Vancouver. And all leading companies are gonna present there and give some updates, so we'll see how much they disclose of what I've seen already and predict the future. Uh, but we're gonna see some sizable insertion. Um, and again, bacteria are different, but I'm assuming you're asking about plants. Why not? Yeah. So 10 kb at a time, 10x. You get to your 100 kb. So Rodolph, thank you very much for coming and for your presentation tonight. It was, I, I thought it was very inspiring. So thank, thank you. you for having me. Um, so I just wanted, as you look at this slide right here, and you see all the things you're doing, I was wondering. What, is, what are some of the key factors at NC State that allow you to be an entrepreneur, be a faculty member? What are the, what are the ways that the university itself and, and the system there has set you up to allow you to have that success in these yeah. various arenas? So, so you can see right here, right? So first of all, there's a reason I see it right here. So they give me money. They enable me, right? So they recruit, Chris actually recruited me, just for the record. So I have support. I have the facilities, I have the people, I have the equipment, I have the freedom to operate that I need to get that done. Um, to do that stuff, though, you need a good tech transfer office. So there's a reason Kelly is here, because she used to be the head of the tech transfer office at NC State. She can tell you about how fun and challenging and rewarding it's been to have some success with Locust. So, you know, uh, it comes at a cost. It's a lot of work, a lot of effort. It's not always as fun as you think it is. But the bottom line is this is very successful. So RTP itself, right, it's not just NC State. It's RTP. We have facilities. We have people. We have key opinion leaders. We have hosting facilities. We have investors. And we have a whole community of talent. That's one of the reasons why I am at NC State, not just because of NC State itself, but also because of the local talent the local opportunity to do translational science, and not just do that, because this is what happens at universities. Sometimes people happen at universities, you get a little bit of this, and you do your 100 KB insertion that you want. But in the end, to develop a product, there's a different skill set. That's the reason why we need people like Paul to be CEOs, because to execute is a different game. I can't execute. I can come with the idea. I can maybe tell, give you my opinion for free on how to do it. It doesn't mean I'm going to do it. It's too hard much work, it's too stressful, right? So you need to have all those ingredients. And the whole point is, and this is why I have that here, but time permitting, um, I'm a food scientist. I do food. I mean, food science. So I used to be French, and I like all the champagne, and pasteur, and all that stuff. And to me, I see this as a food recipe. To be successful, right, you need a good recipe, your grandma's recipe, your father's, mother's, and grandmother's recipe. You need good ingredients, right? Like beef from Mizu and you know, good stuff on the side. You need good wine, you had some good wine last night, right? A little bit of salt, pepper, spices, good company. And then maybe when you combine all those things together, you'll be successful. You need all those different ingredients. I walked you through here all the ingredients I think you need to be successful. It's a lot of things. Now there's master chefs that go dumpster diving and give you something that tastes awesome. I see people buy a $50 steak and waste it. So just having those ingredients in and of itself doesn't mean you're going to be successful, but having access to a collection of great ingredients increases your chance to be successful when you put them together. And that's what I like about NC State. We have the facilities, we have the people, we have the leadership, we have the strategic plan, right? We have everything we need. But that's not enough. You need to have the driving faculty, you need to have the opportunity, you need to have the IP, you need to have the vision, you need to execute, plan, and implement. And then maybe you're successful, so we'll see.
but it takes a lot to be successful. Sometimes it takes luck and timing too. I think I owe very much of my success due to luck and timing as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Eleazar Gonzalez. Uh, I will. <clears throat> I wonder to what extent we can be aware about the frontier we need to go with science. And also, there's on one side, another side, another question will be, uh, can you explain to what extent sustainability will be an issue in the long run? Because with these signs, with the technologies you are talking about, uh, we kind of are putting the side small farmers, medium farmers, who are unable to use these technologies. Yeah. And rural communities are getting this, this, this desolated. So what is the relationship of these technologies with supporting sustainability in rural communities? So to me, critical. I'm going to start with the last question. To me, it's critical. Sustainability, without sustainability, you can't sell it. It's short-lived, it's a short-term benefit. You can make money, but I think it's foolish. If you cannot address this, and you cannot address this, you can't do the rest. There's a reason it starts here. To me, it starts here. I would actually put those two first and second. If you can't do that, first of all, you're not convinced the politician. You're not. Maybe some of them, but not all of them. And you sure as hell are not gonna convince the public, the farmers, the users, your customers. So if you can't do that, you're wasting your time. You may have some short-lived success, but it's not going to be sustainable, no pun intended. So that to me is extremely important, but that's also part of the narrative to sell the vision, the plan, and the strategy. Now, to answer your first question, predicting the future, you can't. It's hard to tell how people are going to react. It's hard to tell what's going to change. It's hard to tell how ready or not they are for us, the scientists, to trust not just the academics, but to trust the industrials that it takes to commercialize those products. Universities can commercialize some stuff small scale. Brand of ice cream at the local store. They can sell one edited pig for a barbecue right, at the football game. You ain't going to feed the world with one pig. Not here, not anywhere else. You can sell the idea of the pig, but to sell animal well-being, you're going to need consumer trust, not in the research enterprise, but the commercial enterprise. And that's why companies like Bayer bought Monsanto, so they can address some of the PR historical shortcomings, be more strategic about image and marketing and messaging and vision, and engagement, and transparency, and science. It's very important. To me, it's very important. I think it's an important question. It's an important topic. And when you sell the story and frame the dialogue, to me, this is where you start, and this is where you end. Because if you don't, it's not going to work. You can, you can rely on medicine, but I think that'd be a mistake. More specifically, could you elaborate on what are the conversations you're hearing in these boardrooms, um, especially around the ability to improve the whole world or improve everyone's lives? So what's the equity piece? And how is this being, you know, I, I can totally see it benefiting the 1% per se, but how is, how is this being um, discussed? So you have, you have to make it relevant to the limiting stakeholders, which is not the one percenters. Now the 10 percenters, actually, it's the 50 percenters, even the rest of the world. So reforestation, that's why I work on trees. Reforestation, not just fiber content, not just the color of wood, but reforestation to address deforestation. Right? Use of arable land more sustainably. We have to do that. I have a whole company set up moving forward to just address that. Now, I don't know how successful we're going to be. The fundraising is so much harder in that case. But I think it's a noble cause worth pursuing, and we're not there yet. If we can't even tell the story of ag, the animals and the crops, right, we're going to have to work on the narrative for 
sustainability, reforestation, greener planet, better planet, CO2 emissions and the like. And this is where some companies are doing a very good job, like Novozymes in particular as a great chief sustainability officer. So being able to capture the financial value of sustainability is going to be important for investors. So there's some frameworks to do that. You can do like zero carbon emission net for a company, but not for a genome editing company, for an operational company with a footprint, with a supply chain. Um, or even like energy stewardship. Can you give back to the grid more than you create? Or can you pay and buy back energy footprint, energy credit at the mega scale? It's, it's, so some companies do that very well. We're not there yet with most ag companies that are very energetically inefficient in terms of emission and water usage. So let me talk about water usage. But that's on the map. People are working on this. I've been in a number of sensitive meetings with key opinion leaders where we discussed that, so I can't go into details necessarily, but it's on the map because of that. And water usage, energy usage, carbon footprint are all on the list, high. Popularly, there's a large discussion around food waste, and I think, I think that would be a great. So in terms of food waste, so there's, there's more mixed feelings, to be honest with you, about food waste. There was a meeting last week in DC, and this, this doesn't seem to resonate as much as one would think. I, I was kind of on your, your I, I mean, I was like originally going in, I'm like, we could like save 30% of the food, 50% of the food, feed the rest of the world and everything. This, the, the numbers that I've heard and seen from people that I trust or experts in the topic, which I'm not, um, the data does not seem to support this as much as one would think. And the value when you ask people to like rank things, um, I think they talk a lot, but they don't seem to care as much as they, they claim they do. So I'd be more guarded about uh, reducing food waste as the solution to the food gap. But disease resistance and shelf life yeah. are absolutely food waste. They're linked. Issues. Yeah, they're linked. But it's not just itself, just feeding the world. Yeah. So part of the equation, part of the puzzle, part of the narrative, part of the solution, but not high on the strategic tree as far as I've heard as of late. Thank you. Leave that to yourself. Well, folks, uh, we're getting getting on. Maybe I mean, one maybe more. we can take one more question if there's one more question. Otherwise, we'll okay. All right, one more in the back. One more. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Black and gold. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the food safety. You told you are a food scientist, and uh, this CRISPR technology only six years old. Like, well, after the revolution, or how you call it. So how do you go about a food safety? It's not enough time, six years, to test it on a human, I'd say, like the food which, which was CRISPRized. <laughs> so actually, so, so food safety has multiple parts to it, right? So first of all, CRISPR-based phage resistance in starter culture has been occurring for millennia. It's a natural phenomenon, and that's actually how I and my colleagues at DuPont discovered adaptive immunity. So we've been eating CRISPR forever. We've been eating bacteria unbeknownst to us that have been CRISPR enhanced forever. So it is safe, we know that. We have thousands of years of history of food fermentation based on CRISPR that tell us that. And you can go back to the 2007 paper we published and you'll see that's how we actually discovered the role of CRISPR. Because I came across a historical phage resistant variant that had been CRISPR altered. That was already commercialized unbeknownst to us. So we know it's safe from a non-toxicity standpoint in the human food supply chain. Secondly, in terms of food safety, we've been able to use CRISPR to map all and do the detective sleuth work that we need to identify bacteria responsible for food infections, food disease. So the spinach outbreak, including in Pennsylvania back in the days with Penn State, we've worked with the CDC, we've worked with the FDA, We've worked with a number of academic institutions to map disease isolates in the food, uh, food safety and food supply chain realm for E. coli, the salmonella, notably, as well as other contaminants, both in humans, in food, and in animals. We're doing a study right now, I can't talk about it too much because I don't have all the results, uh, with a, a vet school, a good example of like, working across boundaries and colleges 
Um, and we're sampling salmonella in farms in Carolina before and after the hurricane. We had a big hurricane last year. I'm sure you guys saw that on TV. And we're trying to see, using CRISPR, how much salmonella diversity at the farm level changed before and after a cataclysmic event, like a hurricane. So, so we're mapping food safety. I have some slides on this. I didn't have time to show today because it's a little bit out of the topic. And the third way in which we're addressing food safety is the use of CRISPR antimicrobials, not just to kill infectious disease in humans. That's where the money is. That's where Locust is spending their $818 million that just signed up with Johnson & Johnson to do human genetic disease, to do human infectious disease, in UTI, Pseudomonas, and C. diff. Those are the three indications that they partnered with. So it's like almost $200 million per indication. That kind of money is not working in ag right now. But when ag companies come and knock on their door to work on use of antimicrobials to address either farm or food, the technology will be there for food safety. So there's a lot of either natural means, antimicrobial means, or monitoring means to improve human food safety using CRISPR. And I'm working on that literally every day. So there's, there's a lot of tangible work, tangible progress, and we'll get there. Very, very, we're there already for you know, dairy products. We'll be there very, very soon, I think. From a commercial standpoint. All right, thank you all. <laughs>